Mormon Discussions and its lineup of great podcasts is about helping Latter-day Saints like you tackle deeper, complex issues within Mormonism. All financial support goes directly towards keeping these podcasts alive and supporting listeners like you. To support the programs on this podcast, please consider becoming a premium subscriber. Or making a donation at mormondiscussions.org. Again, that's Mormon Discussions, plural with an S on the end, dot org. Donate today and support programs like Mormon Discussion, Radio Free Mormon, Mormon Awakenings, The Mormon Wellness Project, Mormon History Podcast, Marriage on a Tightrope, and others. If these programs benefit you and you want to see these continue, please consider making an annual donation starting today. All donations are tax exempt inside the United States and go towards keeping the podcast alive. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight we have something new for you. We are inaugurating a series of interviews where we will be having on the program guests with interesting insights and parts to play in the ever evolving world of Mormonism. The working title for these interviews will be Radio Free Mormon After Dark. For the first of these interviews, I am very pleased and happy to announce that we have McKenna Denson on the program. You will recall that McKenna Denson is at the very heart of the storm of controversy surrounding a lawsuit against the LDS Church and Joseph Bishop, the former president of the Missionary Training Center, who McKenna Denson alleges raped her in the basement of the Missionary Training Center when she was a sister missionary back in 1984. Now, I will be up front with you and tell you that it takes a great deal of time and effort to produce these programs. Bill Reel has been very kind to me in tutoring me in the new software and all the new editing techniques that I had to learn in order to produce this interview. I have been working on this interview for a number of weeks now. It takes a great deal of time and effort to produce these podcasts, and especially this interview because I'm just learning the ropes. I would like to ask you to take a moment to go to the Mormon Discussions webpage, and if you appreciate what Radio Free Mormon is giving into your life, and the other great podcasts at Mormon Discussions, to take that moment and make a contribution today. No, screw today. Go there right now. Put this episode on pause. Go make that contribution, please. And when you come back, I'll still be here. I promise. Doing these podcasts is not just a hobby for me. It is my passion. But as I say, it takes a great deal of time, effort, and expense. The time and the effort I am more than happy to put out. But when it comes to the expense, that's where we depend on you, the listener. I also want to say a few words about the sound quality of this interview. This is my first interview. This is my first time with the software. And so I want to let you know that in some spots, there will be issues with the volume. It will be a bit soft in some places, but those are only of limited duration. The volume will increase afterwards. So I don't want you to hear it go soft with McKenna's voice. Have you increase the volume and then have it suddenly blast your ears out. Just listen carefully at those points. I want to thank McKenna Denson, not only for coming on the program, but for coming on the program knowing that it was my first attempt at conducting an interview and being game enough to come on and tell her story, even knowing that the production quality might not be absolute perfection. And though it's not absolute perfection, it's pretty darn good, especially considering it's my first attempt. And more important than the production quality is the content of this interview. McKenna Denson has the opportunity to not only talk about what happened to her at the MTC, but to describe to you her story in her words of her life leading up to the MTC and her life after the MTC and all the amazing and unusual things that have happened to her in her life that makes her story resonate so much with me and I'm sure it will resonate with you. So enough of the introduction. Now I present to you McKenna Denson in the very first interview of Radio Free Mormon, After Dark. McKenna Denson, welcome to Radio Free Mormon. Can I say your name? No, of course you can't say my name. I'm completely <laughs> anonymous. anonymous. Now you can call me Radio, and you can call me Radio Free. 
But you don't have to call me Radio Free Mormon. Oh, thank God. Okay. Thank you, Radio Free. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Or just Ray. Uh, no, because that gives me images of Ray Charles, and you just don't fit that image. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for agreeing to be on the show. This is the very first interview that we are conducting at Radio Free Mormon, and we are honored and overjoyed to have you be the first person to be interviewed here. Thank you for that. Well, I appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here, and I appreciate you taking your time to interview me. You are very kind. What I want to do is give you a chance to tell your story in your own words. And I wanted to start with your childhood, and mainly the part of your childhood which was difficult, not to focus on it, but mainly because there's part of your childhood that may have made you a target later on for Joseph Bishop. Can you address that as far as you want to with the audience? Absolutely. So my mother divorced my father when I was an infant, and she moved from New Jersey to Reno, which is where she was born and raised. And when she married my stepfather, um, I was about three, and he started molesting me and my sister, who was two years older than me, about that time. Um, it was... He was a pedophile. Um, his biological daughter came to live with us when we were in elementary school, and he molested her as well. He molested the girl across the street. Um, he was just, he was a pedophile. He was, he was a terrible, terrible man. Did this ever come to anybody's attention? Did anybody ever report him or catch him? Well, I can tell you that I reported it to one of my teachers. And my teacher in elementary school, mm -hmm. um, she didn't know what to do with it. At that time, of course, I'm 55 years old. So at that time, um, those kinds of things were not mandatory reporting. Mm -hmm. I did talk to my mother about it. I, I got my sister and the girl across the street um, to agree with me to tell our mother, although my mother already knew. But we wanted to put a stop to it. And I was in fourth grade at that time. And so we all met with my mother, and um, it stopped for a little while, but then it started up again. I remember, um, I remember my mother and my sister and my stepfather in their bedroom. It was dark because there was a lamp on, and my mother was sitting next to my stepfather, rubbing his back, and he was crying, and she was crying, and they were explaining to us the terrible things that would happen to him in prison if we were to send him to prison. So there was a real big guilt trip put on us as children. Oh that. my gosh. Okay, so it stopped briefly, and but then it resumed, and then uh, it stopped, what was it, you were 14 years old and something happened? Yeah, mm -hmm. I was 14 years old, and we were um, chased by my stepfather twice, once with a knife, once with, with a gun. Oh my gosh. And then my mother was having a relationship with another woman. Um, she was in a in a lesbian relationship with a woman named Susie, and we ran out of town. I think my mother and this woman had already made a plan, and we went to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it was beautiful, and I got a job first at this, <laughs> this great little hamburger place called Robbie's Monster Burgers, or mm. was it Robbie's Diner? I think it was Robbie's Diner. And he had these monster burgers. It was wonderful. Uh -huh. I, remember, I remember spending three days trying to get a job. And that was the first place um, that anyone took interest, even though I didn't get a job there. I got a job at McDonald's. Um, my mother got a job at Denny's. Um, my sister didn't get a job. And the other woman, Susie, who followed us up there with her two daughters, she never got a job. And I remember... This man at Robbie's Drive-In or Robbie's Diner, I can't remember, um, he had two children, a daughter named Karen um, and a son, and he and his wife let us live in their little camper trailer on the side of their house. And then we moved, I don't know if it was that camper trailer or a different one, but we moved into a camper trailer that was on like... Um, Kind of like a KOA campground site. Mm -hmm. It was my little brother and my older sister, my mother, 
her friend Susie and Susie's two daughters. So it was pretty crowded. Did you ever see your stepfather after that? Um, yeah. Yeah, I did. So my sister, we didn't stay in Coeur d'Alene very long. My sister ran away, and she went to live with my biological father in Florida. She finished high school there, and then she went to Iran with them. I think they lived in Tehran at the time. He worked for Bell Helicopter. And This my, is before the Shah was deposed, shortly before, correct? It was about that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because my father and his wife were blown up in a bus, but they didn't die. They were just part of this horrible, horrific incident. So my mom and my little brother and I moved back to Reno. We lived with my grandparents for a little while, and then my sister moved back, and she got pregnant. She was living with my stepfather. She moved into an apartment with him, and I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that was his child. Oh, my goodness. It was bad. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. bad. I don't want to get mired down into that, even though I'm the one who asked the question to begin with, but I think it sets the stage for what happens later. And at some point, now, you're not a member of the LDS Church at any time during this, correct? No, I've never even heard of Mormons then. Can you tell us about your introduction to Mormonism and how it was that you joined the church? Yeah, I was in high school, and I had a critical issues class. And in that class, we talked about important topics. We talked about capital punishment. We talked about abortion. We talked about what it meant to get to the top, you know, in, in business. Um, and there were a group of kids in that class that our teacher kind of made fun of and ridiculed a little bit. Hmm. And now, looking back, I can see that he he did that. He ribbed them and teased them and mocked them. Not to be mean, but more as a way of bringing conversation into our class, more debate, more ideals. So I would listen to these kids, and, and they would not back down on abortion or death row, for example, what it means, capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And it made me very curious. I wondered what made these kids so strong that they would, they were being, you know, it's like the whole class turned on them. And they would not for a minute back down. And I think that teacher really respected them. Mm -hmm. And it made me really, really curious. Yes, and I'm guessing these were Mormons. They were complete Mormons, but okay. I didn't even know what that meant. I'd never even heard that word before. Okay, so you got curious because of the way they stood their ground on political and moral issues. And then what Correct. happened? I started taking the missionary lessons. Well, did something, and... something must have happened between your being interested and curious about them and you taking missionary lessons. Well, I got to know the kids a little bit. Found out they were Mormon. Wasn't sure what that meant. Yeah. Um, I was living with my mom. I was 15 years old, and I had to sneak out to go to church. I wasn't allowed to go to the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. My mother forbid it. So I, I would put a dress in a paper bag, and I had to borrow the dress because I didn't even own a dress, and I would run from my mom's apartment down to the chapel, and I would change my clothes in the bathroom, and I couldn't always sit through all the meetings. I could make it to sacrament and sometimes uh, young women's, and then I'd have to run home in my overalls and hide the dress under my bed. Where did you tell your mom you were going? She worked night, so she didn't know. She didn't know that I was gone. Oh, she was still asleep? Mm-hmm. Okay, and you had to get home before she woke up? Exactly. Got it. Okay. Exactly. So then what happened? You're taking the missionary discussions. You're going to church on the sly. <laughs> totally on the sly. I, um, there was this great family named Brigham. Um, there was a kid named Danny, and I kind of had a crush on him. And I took the missionary lessons at his house. And I remember he invited me to a dance, and he called it a steak dance. Mm -hmm. And I was super excited. I'd never been to a dance before, not a school dance, not any kind of dance. And I remember I didn't eat the entire day. I was so excited. I was ready for this steak dance. So I get to the dance with Danny, and there's no food. I was expecting, like, steak and potatoes and <laughs> salad. Of course, it's uh, a steak dance. Exactly. Yeah. That was my introduction to Mormon dances. So mm -hmm. your first Mormon dance, you're very hungry all night. <laughs> all night. Yeah. 
Hey, I took the missionary lessons at Danny Brigham's house, and I remember asking him if his family changed their name because of Brigham Young. And he said, no, we're Brigham. He's Brigham. I said, oh, <laughs> I didn't know. Everything was so new to me. Sure. But these, these were great people. They were a great example of Christian beliefs, and I embraced the gospel. And I read the Book of Mormon, and I studied the Book of Mormon, and... I was baptized on my 16th birthday, and then I moved out of my mom's house. Okay, hang on just a second. If I can break in here. Uh Uh-huh. You've been going to church on the sly. Your mom doesn't know about it. I'm guessing she doesn't know about you taking the missionary discussions. Oh, no. So how do you get baptized without her knowing? I didn't get baptized without her knowing. My 16th birthday was coming up, and she didn't have money to buy me a gift. Hmm. So that was her gift to me. She allowed me to get baptized. Which she thought was probably a fad in my life. Right. It'll pass. Sure. But it didn't. No. No, it certainly didn't. So you got baptized on your 16th birthday. Mm-hmm. And then I take it you're an active, believing, devout Mormon for uh, quite a period of time after that. But something happens, I think, maybe the next year. Not the next year. I was 19 when I had my daughter, Jessica. So I was working at a preschool. And there was this little boy in the preschool that was really cute. They were all really cute. But this one little boy had this really handsome uncle who was a police officer, and he would come and pick up his his nephew on occasion. So I kind of got to know him, and he was Mormon. He wasn't very active, but he was Mormon. And I started dating him, and I wanted to go on a mission. I, that's what I had been planning to do since I joined the church because I went from the childhood that I had to this amazing, peaceful, joyful, safe life. And I wanted to go spread that with the world. Mm -hmm. I could not believe that life could actually be like that. So I'm dating this young man and he had been a police officer, but now at this time he had just changed professions. He was doing security and we start dating And there was one night in particular where he had been kind of pushing um, for more intimate relations. I wasn't ready for that. I didn't want that. And one night in particular, he was pretty determined. Um, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence or self-esteem. And no to him didn't necessarily mean no. And I think I gave him mixed signals. Either way... It was non-consensual. <laughs> Should I say non-consensual immorality? <laughs> it, it, <laughs> there was some non-consensual immorality going on there. Exactly. So but basically, he kept pushing you and pushing you. You ended up having sex, even though he you didn't want to and you had told him no. Yes, it was a date rape. Got it. But because I gave him mixed signals, I really felt responsible for what happened. But yeah, that one time I got pregnant. And I moved to California, and I had Jessica. I had a baby girl, and I gave her up through LDS Family Services. Um, I learned that the family um, that she was adopted to had been waiting for years, couldn't have any children, and they were really, really excited to have her. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I knew was that they were given this baby girl in a stocking, and that was really, really amazing to me. Can you explain what you mean by in a stocking, in a literal stocking? Literal, because she was born in December. Oh, okay, Christmas. It was a Christmas stocking. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, so so the baby was born December 1st, 1982, Mm -hmm. and then she went through a process of being in in foster care, LDS foster care, and when LDS Social Services gave the baby to the parents, they put her in a Christmas stocking because it was almost Christmas time. I see. Isn't and that sweet? It is very sweet. And you were there to witness that? No. No, it was a closed, sealed adoption. But the my caseworker told me. I see. But you did this through LDS Social Services in California? Yes, in Huntington Beach. Okay. And that's 1982? Correct. Okay. So if I'm doing my math right, um, let me see. 1982, you're 19 then. Is that right? Correct. All right. So... 
you give this baby up by adoption. Did you feel any kind of pressure or any kind of peer pressure or anything from the church to give the child up for adoption? No. You know what? I didn't. Um, my stepfather always told me that if he would always follow me around and if I ever had a girl, he would come and get her. And there was fear for me. And I was young and I was not very mature and I was afraid of what had happened to me. Yes. Um, and I was afraid of him. I just didn't feel ready to be a mom. I didn't feel like it, I'd be a good mom. I didn't feel like I was mature enough to love, care for, and nurture another human being. Okay. So you give your baby up for adoption, and her name is now out there, and she's come out publicly, correct, on her Facebook page. This is Jessica? Yes, Jessica Louder. Jessica Louder. Louder's the name of her adopted adoptive family. Correct. And they named her Jessica. Uh-huh. Okay, got it. Um, did you face any kind of church discipline for getting pregnant out of wedlock? No, I did not. Who was the name of your bishop? He sounds Riley. like one in a million. <laughs> His name was Bill Riley. I'm not even sure if he's alive anymore. Yeah, he was amazing. He knew that that was not, what happened to me was not my fault. Okay, and so you were not disfellowshipped. He didn't say you can't partake of the sacrament. You weren't put on probation. No. Okay. But you're 19 at the time, and uh -huh. there's still at least two years that have to run, because this is back in the early 1980s, and the missionary age for sisters, you've got to be 21 years old, correct? Correct. So what happened between that time and the time you went on your mission? I was living in Southern California. I was living in Huntington Beach, actually. And there was a couple in my ward, and the wife ran the Montessori school, mm -hmm. and she let me work there for a little while, but it was really, really hard to be around little children, having just given up my baby. Yes. Her husband was a dentist, and so he offered me a job in his office, and he trained me to be a dental assistant, and I worked there until I left on my mission. Okay, great. So yeah. you, you go on your mission. You have not changed your mind about wanting to serve a mission and teach the gospel. Not for a minute. What was it like when you got your mission call? Oh my gosh. I was so excited. I had an idea that I would go foreign speaking and I was hoping it wouldn't be like, I don't know, China so that I'd have to learn Chinese or Japanese or something crazy like you did. Yeah, Japanese really tough, believe me. I know. I know. I know because I speak Mandarin now. Um so I got my mission call to Colombia, Kali Mission. And I was so excited. I was so excited. I was thinking I was going to go save the entire Lamanite world <laughs> because they're just waiting for me with my excitement and my love of the gospel, my love of the Lord, for me to come and give them the truth. Well, and at the time, the missionary work was going great guns in South America, if I recall correctly. Um, it was, yes. Okay, so you're going to go to... Columbia on your mission, but you've got to report to the MTC first for some training. Right. So at that time, and I don't know if it's changed, but at that time, if you were an English speaking missionary, meaning you went to a country or you stayed in America, if you went to a country that spoke English, you stayed for, I believe, a month. Mm -hmm. If you went foreign speaking, you were there for two months. So you learn how to teach the gospel and you learn a language. So that's what I did. I went to the MTC in Provo, Utah. Did you report uh, at the very beginning of January 1984? I did. The, the beginning, well, at some point in January. It was close to the beginning, I believe. Okay, so roughly you were there for January and February of 1984, maybe a little bit into March. Correct. And I know that there was a, an absolutely horrible and atrocious thing that happened while you were at the MTC. And we'll get to that in a second. But there was something else that happened. First off, your Spanish instructor. You got along very well with your Spanish instructor, correct? Uh, you know what? I had more than one Spanish instructor, but yes, one was a male, and I really liked him, but I don't remember his name. Mm -hmm. The female I loved, her name was Stacy Ballard. Stacy Ballard. Yeah. Her dad was one of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Elder Ballard. Right. And you ended up having a, a meeting of sorts with Elder Ballard while you were at the MPC, I correct? <laughs> I did, yeah, I did. Can you tell us about that? I can, yeah. So I had worked for this dentist, um, and he had taken care of my all of my dental work. Um, 
And I had braces, and my braces came off just before my mission. And this dentist did all my dental work, and I was good to go. But I got to the NTC, and I had this terrible toothache. And I remember um, I, I called him, and I spoke to him about it. And he said, well, let me, let me call somebody from dental school that I know is in Provo. And I could not get rid of this toothache. So we arranged um, for me to go see this dentist. So I went to see this dentist, and he did some x-rays, and he said, okay, you need a root canal. So I was um, in a lot of pain, and Sister Ballard, Edamana Ballard, um, she said, let me call my dad. Um, he'll come down from Salt Lake. He'll do anything for me. And then I can also get him to take me out to dinner and have ice cream. I said, oh, double whammy. Yay. <laughs> so Elder Ballard came from Salt Lake, and we met um, in the mission president's office, and he gave me a priesthood blessing and told me if I had faith, it would all be healed. And I felt better. And I went to my room thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm healed. This is amazing. I don't even have a toothache. I don't need a root canal. And I got up the next morning, and I certainly needed a root canal. You went wasn't feeling dentist. better by the next morning? <laughs> no. And I went to the dentist, and he did a root canal on the wrong tooth. Oh, my gosh. Talk about a double whammy. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, it was crazy. So, yeah, I, I thought that was my not, my not very humble pride. Oh, so you blamed yourself. Well, kind of. I'm yeah. sensing a pattern here that's already developing. Everything that happens to you that's bad somehow becomes your fault. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so you get a blessing from M. Russell Ballard at Correct. the MTC in the mission president's office. And I went back and did a little bit of research, and I found out that M. Russell Ballard actually was not an apostle yet, because this was in the early part of 1984. He was a high-ranking member somewhere in the church, but did not become an apostle until October of 1985, when he was called to take the spot that was vacated by the passing of Elder McConkie. Aha! Thank you for clarifying that. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe if he had been an apostle, it really would have been healed. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But Or maybe I had too little faith. I don't know. It's, oh, there's so many ways. I did a podcast about that once. So many people to blame. So little time. <laughs> but 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 here's the other thing. The other thing that's going on, and it's, of course, a thing that all my listeners know about, and uh, if they don't, I certainly want them to hear it from your mouth anyway, is that you're having this blessing by M. Russell Ballard in the mission president's office. And the mission president at the time is a man named Joseph Bishop. Yes, correct. And Joseph Bishop had started paying special attention to you from the very day that you got to the missionary training center, correct? Yep, that's correct, too. Can you go over what happened with Joseph Bishop? Yes, actually I can. So the first day I got to the MTC, I went by myself. Um, I didn't have any family or friends that went with me to the MTC like many other missionaries. Um, it was family day because the families bring their missionaries and drop them all off. And it was kind of an unusual, it was kind of, Unusual to be there by yourself with no parents, no nothing. <laughs> but there were others just like me, so I wasn't the only one. Um, Joseph Bishop looked me right in the eye from across the room, um, in, kind of in the hallway area, not too far from where his office is. And that evening, he had a welcome to the mission uh, for all the new missionaries. And there were, I think, about 1,200 missionaries that day. Mm -hmm. So he had this big meeting, welcome to your mission, and he called on me out of the crowd of 1,200 to bear my testimony, which I did. And then the next time the missionaries met, and I believe it was the next day, he asked me again um, to give the prayer, which I did. And then he started calling me out of class. So first time he called me out of class, it was to his main office there on that ground level floor of the MTC. Mm -hmm. Right up there in the front, correct? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Right across from where the cafeteria is. Yes, you see, uh -huh. I was there, but I never actually got called into the mission president's office. <laughs> but I kind of know where, where it was. Um, yeah. Can you tell us, what was the procedure that was used when he called you out of your class? How did that happen? Um, someone came and got me. Is that some other missionary? I don't remember. I don't know if it was a missionary, if it was an employee. I don't really remember. I just remember 
thinking I was in trouble, thinking, uh-oh, wait, what? Why would the mission president want to talk to me? Right. So they would come to the door, knock on the door of the classroom and mm-hmm. say, uh, Sister Denson, uh, mission president, Bishop wants to see you. Um, they would call me by my name then, which was Hughes. And they would say, could you come meet with the mission president? Yeah, pretty much. And then they would take you to the mission president's office. Your companion stayed in the classroom? Oh, yes. Okay. So it's just you going with this other yes. person to the mission president's office. So when you got to the mission president's office, what would happen? Well, the first time, there were three other sisters in there. And we're all missionaries. And we're all the same age. And we all have big eyes who are going, why are we here? Mm-hmm. And Joseph Bishop um, was behind his desk. He had this big desk. Um, And he just talked to us. And he said, call me Joe. And he spoke to us. Call me Joe? Mm-hmm. Okay. And he spoke to us by our first names. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When I I say call me Joe, that's just the most un-Mormon priesthood sounding thing I've ever heard in my life. That was the only time I have ever been asked to speak to somebody and give them my first name. No missionary, no mission president ever asked me that again. Okay, so he wants you to call him Joe. Does he call you by your first name? He does. And the other three sister missionaries too? Yes, he does. Okay, please continue. So um, he starts asking very general questions about our childhood, which leads up to um, the sexual abuse, the sexual trauma that we all experienced as children. And as it turns out, we had all had the same background. What a coincidence. I know, right? Yes, so, it sounds like more than coincidence. Do you have any idea as to how it is? First off, let me back up a second and say, if Joseph Bishop has four sister missionaries in his office and they all have a similar history of being sexually abused in their childhood, that obviously is more than coincidence. This is something that he has planned, that he has figured out who has the history of the sister missionaries that he wants to meet with. Do you have any idea how he figured that out? I have an idea, but it's just speculation, so it's an opinion. My opinion is that when you have problem missionaries, I would have been flagged as a problem on two levels. One, I had had sexual trauma as a child, and bonus, I had a child out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. So if it's true that my file was flagged, my file had my photograph in it. So he would have known exactly when I walked in the door who I was because he would have been looking for me. Mm -hmm. And at this point, that's what I think happened. I can't swear it, but that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Right. I agree with you. There must have been some mechanism for him to know who it was that he wanted to have in his office. But okay, go ahead and just tell us what happened. Now, he's talking with you on a first-name basis. He's talking with you about your childhood, all four of you, and you all have the similarity in background. And why is it that he, he's talking about this and wanting to find out about this? At least, why is he saying he does? He's saying that in spite of the fact that we had been raped and molested as children, that God loved us and that we were special, that all of that negative childhood made us more Christ-like. It made us more empathetic and compassionate. And that it wasn't a mistake that those things happened to us. And that we needed to look at our sexual abuse as a blessing. And that we were going to be amazing missionaries because of that. And that we were special and we were chosen. Okay. So that all sounds very positive, though maybe a little bit misguided theologically. But he's giving a very positive message to all four of you. And so that should be it, right? There's no need for any more meetings. Well, that should have been the end of that meeting, and it wasn't. He wanted sexually explicit details. He wanted to know how far the abuse went, what kind of abuse was it. Was it was it fondling? Was it oral? Was it penetration? He wanted to know details. From all four of you when all four of you were together? Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Well... How did that make you feel saying that, not only in front of the mission president, but in front of three other sister missionaries? I didn't. I didn't share. Oh. Okay. Did other of the missionaries share? Um, Yes. One other did. The other two were really uncomfortable, and they started squirming in their seats. And, in fact, I never saw those two sisters again. And I don't know. I've, I've speculated over the years if they were just too wise 
if they had family members that they could contact and it made President Bishop nervous? Had he already assaulted them and that was their last visit in there with him? Or were they just too smart and said, I am not coming back? Hmm. But this, this other sister missionary that was there, and I only knew her first name. She and I were, um, we participated in two other meetings with President Bishop. So we were called out two more times, and we were interviewed together, and we laughed, and we talked. I remember this sister, because she told this story. She told the story about going to the prom with this boy in high school, and she fell asleep on his shoulder, and she drooled all over his tux. I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, I would never admit that out loud. I was mortified. I had no self-confidence whatsoever. I would never have admitted that I drooled all over some guy's tux. Isn't now that I funny could. that that's what you remember, and yet what he's asking for are details of other experiences that are much more graphic? Yep, and that's what I remember, yeah. Okay, so there's one meeting with four sister missionaries, and then it becomes two additional meetings with just you and this one other sister missionary. Right. It could be three, but I remember two specifically, yeah. Is he continuing to ask about sexual details in the subsequent meetings? He is. But he makes us real comfortable talking about funny things like this silly story that the sister had about the prom date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which made it seem like conversation more than anything else. Yeah, he was pretty tricky. About how long are these meetings lasting? Mm, hour, hour and a half. That long? Yeah, they were long. They were detailed. So what are you thinking while all this is going on? I mean, you're having these meetings, first with four sister missionaries, you go back to class, then another day comes, and then there's you and one other sister missionary, and conversations, you go back to class, another day comes, there's another meeting. What are you thinking in between these meetings? That there was something wrong with me, that God is really wanting me to repent of something or feel guilty for something, that there's no way that the mission president, who is right up there with the apostles, would be asking these questions if God didn't want him to. And I was wondering if there was something I was missing. Hmm. One other thing I just want to ask, um, this may be neither here nor there, but um, as you and I know, and as everybody who's ever been to the MTC knows, you're separated into, first off, you're separated into um, uh, different countries that you're going to. And then you're separated into different groups or districts. So what I'm trying to get at is these other sister missionaries, did you ever see them at the MTC other than the times you were in these meetings with President Bishop? I saw this other sister that I was groomed with. I never saw the two from the first meeting. I never saw them again. But this other sister, I saw her once or twice in the cafeteria. We, I don't believe she was Spanish-speaking. The reason I was asking about your contact with these other three sister missionaries is because I was wondering whether you ever had the opportunity to talk with one of them about what was going on and share your feelings. I did not. Yeah, they were not part of my district. They were not sisters that were on the same schedule as me. You know, we don't have however many missionaries there are at one time all go to the cafeteria together or the gym or to class. So, no, I never I, I never had an opportunity just to speak with those sisters or even see them except the one sister that I was personally groomed with when I saw her in the cafeteria. Okay, got it. Now you were saying that all of a sudden all that stopped and by all that, what do you mean? I mean, I, I no longer had interviews that included other sister missionaries. Okay, tell us about that please. Well, I started having interviews one-on-one -on -one with President Bishop. And we talked about normal things. We talked about opportunities of different mission callings because in Colombia, they weren't giving women or the sister missionaries visas because of the drug cartels. So in Colombia at the time, they were killing 10 Americans for every one Colombian arrested on drug charges. So it was not a safe place for sisters. So there was no chance I was going to Colombia. Hmm. President Bishop talked all kinds of crazy things like he one time he was telling me that they were going to open a Spanish branch in Tokyo and I was like wait what <laughs> so you're going to keep learning Spanish because we might send you to Tokyo there were other things that he talked about other other um, 
mission callings, you know, I, I wasn't going to go to Columbia, he said. So there were other places. So he pulled me in just to chat me up about that. And let me just say that all creepiness aside, he sounds like an engaging individual. Um, he has a way of that charm mm-hmm. make you feel he's completely safe and benign. So I can tell you more things about what happened in those meetings when they were one-on-one with Joseph Bishop in his office on the first floor of the MTC and myself. Um, I'd be called out of class, and he would, you know, start speaking generically about where I may go and, and what may happen because I wouldn't be able to go to Columbia because of the visa situation. And there were three distinct stories he told me um, that you can hear. I relate to on the recording when I secretly interviewed him in um, Chandler, Arizona in December of 2017. And one of those stories, he starts talking about how important it is to have a great sexual relationship with your spouse. And I remember thinking, I felt really uncomfortable with that. And then he kept on and he talked about how he and his wife didn't have a good relationship. And he had mentioned that there was a particular blouse, I thought, like a peasant blouse with an elastic shoulder that he liked her to wear during a candlelit dinner and pull it down and expose their breasts while they're eating dinner. And I remember thinking, why is he telling me this? That's really uncomfortable. It's very creepy. My gosh. And then he would, you know, change the subject and talk about something, you know, generic, back to spiritual things. And another meeting we had, he told me that um, he and some other church leaders would go to either the hot springs or the hot tub somewhere. And in my mind, I always saw Wyoming, but he corrects that in the recording. And he says, no, this happened in Utah. But what he told me was there were these other church leaders that he would go with, would go in the hot tub, or they would go in the hot springs. And he told about this one time where there was a woman there with them, and she took her bikini top off. And I remember thinking, okay, and you're telling me this because why? Did he and say I, anything that, that happened after the bikini top came off? No, he didn't. He didn't talk about anything else after that. Did you get any sense that he's gauging your reactions to these stories? Really gauge my reaction. In fact, I was just going to mention that. Yes, yes, because when I would get this okay kind of look, he would change the subject. Right. He did it very gently. It's like switching lanes very slowly, um, and then he would ease on back into what we really should be talking about, which is mission callings and whatever. Mm-hmm. And then there was a third story you'd mentioned. Mm-hmm. And I, at the moment, can't remember what that is. So we'll have to get back to that. Okay, well, if that comes to mind, just let us know. But the thing that re- one of the things that surprised me when I read the police reports in your case is they went and they talked with your Spanish instructor. And I know from talking with you that this was Sister Ballard. Correct. And they're talking with her, what, that's 1984. They're talking with her in 2017. That's, what, 33 years ago? Correct. And... They, they call her up and ask her if she can remember you and what can she remember about you. And I thought, well, this is going to lead nowhere because no Spanish instructor from 33 years ago is going to remember one missionary out of all the missionaries that they have. But I was surprised that she did remember you and that one of the things that she remembered about you was how often you were called out of class. She did remember that, yes. Which tells she me did. that you were called out of class a lot. I was. I absolutely was, yes. Okay, so you're now meeting one-on-one with President Joseph Bishop in his office. It's gone from four sister missionaries down to two sister missionaries down to just you. Mm-hmm. And at some point, he makes you a an offer, an invitation. Yes, he did. Mm-hmm. And what was that? Well, we were in his office, and we were back on spiritual things. We were back on healing from trauma. We were back on talking about how the Lord only has his most righteous spirits in heaven that agree to come down and go through that kind of a childhood. And that we did that for somebody else. We apparently were saving somebody else from having that experience. So then he says, would you like to see this room where I prepare my my talks, where I do my spiritual preparation? 
And I remember thinking, yeah, that'd be great. I was thinking, <laughs> in my mind, I was thinking like a temple room. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. So I followed him out, and we went down these stairs, and we went through a couple of locked doors, and there was this dark tunnel. Um, it was really stinky. It was like mildewy. Mm-hmm. And then he unlocked the door, and we went into this room, and from there, um, I think you're going to need to revert back and fill it in with what I've already said in my press conference. Okay. And so um, my understanding is that is when he made a move on you, which you pushed back on, and then he forced himself upon you and then raped you. Yes. And then you fought back, managed to get away, and then you left the room. Correct. Okay. Do you remember anything after that? I don't remember how I got to my room. I don't remember if I had my shoes or if I didn't. I don't remember any of that. I just remember being in my room, um, falling into myself, and pretending I was sick. But there were some unusual things, too, before that. Not unusual, really, but... So, Stacy Ballard, who was my Spanish teacher, we got on very well at first, and then... Things started to change with me. I, my whole demeanor and behavior changed. I became more isolated and private because I was really uncomfortable with what was happening with Joseph Bishop, all the questions and all the comments he made about his wife and taking these other church leaders to this place where some woman took off her bikini top. I was really uncomfortable with those things and so my companion and I basically start stopped talking and my companion kind of joined up with these other two sister missionaries that were in a companionship so I was pretty isolated um, I didn't I didn't make jokes anymore um, I didn't really communicate much I just sort of withdrew into myself um, and that's what happened after the rape which I didn't even consider rape until the BYU police told me that's what that was mm -hmm. Because he didn't have a full erection, and he penetrated only like two inches, and then he pulled away, and that's when I kicked him and fought harder, and that's when I got away. But, um, yeah, I was um, shunned a little bit. I think, you know, there were other sisters and elders in our little group that were kind of making fun of me, mocking me, because I was always called to the president's office. Mm-hmm. So they kind of pulled away from me, and I definitely pulled away from them. I really didn't even understand what was happening. No. Did you ever consider telling anyone? Oh, no. Why not? He was the mission president. He was this godlike person. He was the highest ranking member of the church that I had ever met. Anything that he said or did, in my little mind, came from God. When he was talking to us as sister missionaries, these broken women, he was telling us that he loved us, that God loved us, and that we went through that experience for a purpose, for a reason, and that he would make us stronger and we would be amazing. And I believed it. Hmm. And so when he started sharing his, um, his marital issues and his going to the hot tub or hot springs, I didn't know if he was trying to get a reaction out of me. I didn't know if the Lord was testing me. I didn't know what that was. So when he took me to the basement where he had that secret room, um, I thought I was so stupid. Why did I do that? Why did I go down there? And so part of what I felt was shame, and part of what I felt was you deserve that. You put yourself there. That's your fault. So no, I never told anyone. At least not at that time. After this incident, this rape has happened, where he has finally come out of the closet completely, forced himself upon you, you have fought back, you have made it very clear now that you don't want anything to do with him. Did you ever see him again at the MPC? Oh, yes. Several times. Can you tell us about that? Well, there was really no escape. Um, my district would go to gym at the same time. I quit going to gym. I wouldn't even go. Um, because he would be in the hallway waiting. Every time we went to the cafeteria, he would be waiting and looking for me, and he would 
put his hand up and wave to me and beckon me. And I would just shake my head and walk away. So I never, never spoke to him again. But he did attempt contact with you. Several times, yes. He tried to call me out of class again. I wouldn't go. How did that go down? I mean, somebody comes to you saying, the president of the MTC wants to talk to you, and you just say, no, I'm not going? Yes, that's what I said. No, I'm not going. Wow. So um, at some point then, you graduate from the MTC, and then what Mm -hmm. happens? I'm sent to the Washington, D.C. mission. It was all one mission then. Um, And I'm put in with a companionship that's already established. And And by that, you mean that now instead of two sister missionaries, now there's three? Correct. Okay. So I don't know how much time went by. It wasn't very much. But I started having, I have a word for it now, but at the time I couldn't even label it. Mm -hmm. But I was having full-blown panic attacks. I was having flashbacks, and I was, oh, it was terrible. So we were living in Arlington, Virginia with a single sister, and she had a bedroom for us. And we were on a very high floor. I don't remember what floor it was, but it was a tall apartment building. And I remember telling these two sisters that I forgot my camera in the car and I needed to go get it. And they were already undressed. I hadn't even gotten undressed yet. Um, And they said, well, wait, we'll go with you. And I said, no, that's okay. And I just ran out the door, got on the elevator, and I started pacing around the parking lot. And I had a meltdown. I just had a meltdown. And I don't know how long I was gone, but the sisters came to find me because I was gone so long. And I was kneeling in the parking lot, and um, I was crying. I was hysterical. And I didn't want to tell them, so I told them someone tried to rape me. I just didn't tell them who. <laughs> I didn't tell them. Oh, and that happened at the MTC. It was Joseph Bishop, our mission president. I couldn't get it out. So um, they called the mission president. I was sent to Provo to live with a Mormon family. Did anybody call the police? No. The sister missionaries no. didn't call the police? No, they no. I believe they called our district leaders who called the mission president, or the sisters may have called the mission president directly. And the mission president didn't call the police? No. Even though you're reporting that you had been raped? Right. No, I was reporting that someone tried to rape me. That someone that tried to rape you? Yes. Okay, well, still, it, it would be normal, I would think, to call the police, but nobody did that. Correct. Okay. Um, and by the way, this incident is, to my understanding, primarily why it is that David Jordan, the church's attorney, is claiming that you have made false allegations of rape against other people in your past. Um, yes, but there were two other occasions where, one, there was a man when I was living in um, South Carolina. Um, they found, well, he did. He, he drugged our orange juice. There were days where my children lost time. I lost time. And then there was a night where his wife had left him and he wanted advice on how to get her back. So I met him at a restaurant. We had dinner and we had some wine. And then I don't remember anything else. And the next day I was really, really sore. Like I had had some kind of, not just sex, but hard, violent sex. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, I went to the hospital. Actually, I took a shower and went to my girlfriend's house, and then I went to the hospital. I'm like, I think something happened. And there was evidence that of vaginal tearing. Um, and so I reported it. And that kind of thing was really hard to prove. But they came and they found, um, uh, what's it called, HGB, H- H- the date rape drug. Okay. In, uh, I believe, in our orange juice and in a wine bottle that I had in the fridge. Was he prosecuted? No, they couldn't prove it was him. Ah. All they all they could do was prove that that was in my house. And who did that? We don't know. So. Okay. He, he was ordered to stay away from me. And then he called me again, and I called the cops, and he was arrested again. But I had to move. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into your personal life, and I appreciate your sharing everything that you're sharing. But um, my understanding, though, is that even though you have had, well, a number of unfortunate encounters with members of the opposite sex and even sexually violent encounters, there's only one incident in which you 
made a quote unquote false allegation about somebody else having attempted to rape you. And that was when you were in Washington, D.C. on your mission, when you were having a panic attack and flashbacks to what Joseph Bishop did to you at the MTC. And that in order to explain this panic attack, you didn't say it was Joseph Bishop. You just said it was some other person, otherwise unnamed and undescribed. Yes. But I said that he, this person tried to rape me. Right. um, To cover up the whole panic attack thing I was having. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. That's right. Uh, And the only reason I I bring this up is because I think that's really stretching things for David Jordan to be claiming that that means that you falsely accused other men of raping you in the past. Correct. Then what happens after the panic attack? Do you stay in Washington, D.C.? No, I was sent to live with a family in Provo. Um, Why this family? Did you know them? No, I knew their son. Uh, He went to Japan on his mission. He used to call me Taco Shimai. Uh, Taco Taco Shimai? Well, Sister Taco, because I was going Spanish-speaking and he was going to Japan. Got it. Shimai, by the way, for everybody out there, is sister in Japanese. Right. I didn't know him very well. You don't really get to know anyone in the MTC, but I got to know him and some of his friends. They were all from Provo, Mm -hmm. and it was his family that I went to live with. Um, It was a very short time. Okay, and McKenna, what is the purpose of your living in that family? In other words, you haven't been released from your mission, correct? Correct. Okay, so are you trying to be rehabilitated to go back on your mission? You know, I don't have an answer for that. I can speculate, though. I don't think my mission president, Brian Swinton, in Washington, D.C., believed that I was attacked in the parking lot. I think he also may have had access to my file, which would have indicated that I had had sexual trauma as a child. And I think he was wondering if there, if I was having some kind of an episode based on that. Okay. So, In my opinion, President Swinton was sending me to have some kind of counseling to see if I would be stable enough to complete my mission. Okay, and for our audience who may not know, when a missionary is released from their mission, there's a very specific thing that has to happen, and that's they go to their state president, and the state president lays hands upon their head and formally releases them from their mission, correct? Correct. Okay, so that had not happened with you. Correct. Correct. So you're still on your mission, and I expect then you're still told that you're you're expected to live the mission rules. Yes. No dating, no uh, anything else that would be in violation of the mission rules, but mainly dating. Correct. Okay, so you're back in Provo, Utah now, staying with this family, and uh-huh. what is it that you've been directed to do, to do in order to, uh, I'm just using the word rehabilitate, um, get sure. you back up to speed to be able to go back on your mission? Well, I had to visit with a therapist. Um, I don't remember his name. He was tall. Who arranged that meeting? I don't know. It may have been the bishop in the ward. It may have been... Okay, but it wasn't you. You didn't pick him out of the phone book. Oh, no. Okay. I wouldn't have picked him anyway. Why not? No. You know, I went in to see him, and I was really hoping someone would really ask me what happened. Why was I so upset? He didn't. Why were Um, you hoping that? Because I didn't know how to tell anyone. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't think anyone would believe me. Did you feel like if somebody just asked you the direct question, then you would have the ability to tell what happened? Yes. And I was hoping for that. But that did not happen? No, um, it didn't. Not at all. But I will tell you this, and I didn't mention this earlier. um, Joseph Bishop... When I was trying to make myself presentable, put my clothes back together, and I was trying to leave that terrible room in the basement, Mm -hmm. Joseph Bishop said, no one will believe you. Look at me. Look at you. And I believed him. And quite frankly, he was was right. So I really wanted someone to just ask me so that I could start that conversation so that I could share what really happened. Right. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to just jump right in here and say that my understanding is from watching your press conference a couple of months ago is -hmm. that you have told the story, you have told it to a certified polygraph person or polygrapher. We used to call him polygrapher. Now I understand that the politically correct term is a polygraphist. Oh, okay. So now you know, but you, you had a, um, 
uh, a test with a certified polygraphist. You did tell the story about what happened with you and Joseph Bishop and his attacking you and sexually assaulting you in the basement of the MTC and that you did pass that test with flying colors, correct? Yes. He ha he asked three very specific questions. What were those questions? One was, did Joseph Bishop sexually assault you at the Missionary Training Center? Yes. Did you report this sexual assault to Carlos E. A.C., the Quorum of the Seventy? Yes. I can't remember what the third question was. Oh, I have to go back and look. But yes. I'd say those are yes. two big ones. Oh, those are definitely big ones. And it showed no deception indicated. None. Which, In by fact, the way, for, for the audience, that is the term that polygraphists do use when they're saying that a person is not lying, that there is no deception indicated or NDI. Correct. Okay. All right. So I just want to get in there. The fact is that at least according to a certified polygraphist, that indeed you were telling the truth, that Joseph Bishop may have been right, at least in the short term, but in the long term, he's going to be proven wrong about people not believing you and believing him. Right. You're absolutely right. All right. So uh, we, we have this meeting. You only have one meeting with this counselor, this mental health counselor, correct? He was awful. He... Yeah, he was, he was mocking, and he kept telling me, you have a secret, you have a secret. And I kept thinking to myself, damn right I do, and I'm not telling you. I did not, <laughs> I did not like this man. He right. was, he wasn't interested in me. He wasn't interested in my story. He didn't, he just, he, honestly, he talked about himself the entire hour mm -hmm. we were there. And I refused to go back and see him again. Did anybody want you to? I don't remember. I wouldn't have done it anyway. Okay. So you only have one meeting with a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything else that you did in order to qualify you to return to the mission field? Well, yeah. Actually, I had to meet with Thomas S. Monson. Now, this is Thomas S. Monson, the apostle of the church, recent president of the church who just passed away, I think, in January of this year. That's right. Okay, now I've told you this before, but you have a blessing with Elder Ballard at the MTC. Now you're meeting with President Monson, then Apostle Monson. You sound like the Forrest Gump of Mormonism. <laughs> the Forrest Gump of Mormonism. Yeah, Yay, you Gummy. remember the movie. I like that. The movie where he's <laughs> totally just always remember. bumping into all these famous people. I remember, yeah. It's just amazing to me. But you have a meeting with Thomas S. Monson, and this has to happen or does happen prior to your going back on the mission field. That's right. Can you tell us about that meeting? First off, where did it happen? Um, in the Great and Spacious Building in Salt Lake City. Would that be the church office building? That would be it. Okay, so how is it that this gets set up? Somebody gives you a call? I really don't remember. I just remember being informed that I was to go meet with Thomas S. Monson, um, and that meeting would determine whether or not I went back out into the mission field. Okay. So maybe bishop, maybe state president, but you can't remember, but somebody told you that. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And so there's a date and a time? Date and time. And you show up. And I show up. And I remember what I wore, but I don't remember the interview that much. What did you wear? I wore a white dress, um, and it had a pink bow that tied in the back. Okay. So about what time, this is 1984 still, because you're in the MTC, maybe into early March of 1984. You go to Washington, D.C. initially. You're not there that long before you have the panic attack. And you go back to Provo. And I'm guessing, what, you're not in Provo for more than a month before you go back? I would say that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe we're, I don't know, spring? Maybe late spring of 1984 and you're meeting with President Monson? Yes, that's right. In his office? Yes. I have never been in President Monson's office. I will confess it to you right now. I'm guessing that's on a higher floor of the church office building? It was on a higher floor, yes. So Don't just, ask me now where, but oh, yes. That's fine. I mean, uh, I'm just assuming that when you're an apostle, you get a better view. <laughs> I guess that's the rumor. Okay. I'll go with that. So can you tell us, uh, just take us through this meeting with President Monson step by step as best as you remember? Um, you know, there's a whole lot I don't remember about it. I don't remember a lot of the questions. Um, about how long was the meeting? I think it was close to an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Okay, and this is on a weekday? 
On a weekday. Uh-huh. All right. Um, and you go in there and he, he greets you. And How does he greet you? He shook my hand and he pointed to a seat in front of his desk and I took the seat. Um, we talked about my testimony. We talked about how I joined the church. Um, beyond that, he, I don't remember anything. But I do remember before I left, I got very, very agitated. Do you know why? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I, I, I've had all kinds of questions about, well, why could it be this? Could it be that? Mm -hmm. But I honestly can't tell you, and I don't want to put anything in there that may just be speculation. I don't know. But when I left, I was not comfortable. In what way do you mean that you were agitated and not comfortable? I don't know where our conversation went, but it went somewhere that made me very agitated and very uncomfortable. Okay, so let me ask you a couple of direct questions. Okay. Did you ever mention Joseph Bishop and the assault to Thomas Monson? Not that I remember. Did Thomas Monson ever mention Joseph Bishop's name? Not that I remember. Did Thomas Monson ever talk to you about your time at the MTC? If he did, it was speaking generically. I don't remember him asking any details about my time at the MTC. I don't remember leaving the building. I don't remember how I got back to Utah or to Provo, where, my, where this family was. And I don't know if I was so agitated and upset by the end of our conversation um, or if I just completely spaced it, but I don't remember leaving the church office building, and I don't remember how I got home. But I was very upset when I left. Um, I remember that in a previous conversation that you and I have had, mm -hmm. you had mentioned something about being worried that you're meeting with an apostle, and he has the gift of discernment. Uh-huh. And how did that make you feel? I was hoping anyone with the gift of, of discernment would know what happened to me. Um, a little uncomfortable because I don't really want everyone to know about my childhood. At least I didn't at that time. Mm -hmm. I really didn't want anyone to know about Joseph Bishop. Um, but I kind of did. I kind of hoped that somebody would just ask those questions. It's always intimidating to think someone can see right through you. But I don't know. I just... The whole meeting was really strange. The meeting was strange. And I'd never felt comfortable about that interview. Okay. I think we're probably going to have to leave it at that unless, because my understanding from what you're saying is that you don't, you don't remember exactly what caused that or what was said. You just remember the feeling. Exactly. And I, I wish I could. I, I wish I could pinpoint it and say, well, here's what happened and here's why I felt that way. I can't. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. Well, some people might ask, you know, uh, you're sexually assaulted by Joseph Bishop really only several months before your meeting with Thomas Monson, correct? Yes. And now you're meeting with Thomas Monson and you have an audience or at least a meeting with somebody in the church who is higher in the totem pole than Joseph Bishop. And that that would have been your golden opportunity to tell Thomas Monson, somebody who's higher than Joseph Bishop, somebody who can do something about it. Why didn't you take that opportunity? I have no idea. Okay. That's part a fair... Of it, though, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, it's a fair answer, but I know that part of it, I really didn't believe anyone would believe me. Mm -hmm. I came from child sexual trauma. I came from a broken home. I was the only member in my family. I was just one small person. And Joseph Bishop was this mission president, and he'd been a mission president, and, you know... Well, let me just tell you, um, I asked that question only because I think it's a question that needs to be asked. Um, but I also want to tell you that I understand that when a person is a victim of an assault, and especially a sexual assault, that there is a blame and a guilt and a shame that goes along with that. And there is a desire. And by the way, I'm not just speaking for you. I'm also speaking from personal experience that there's a great shame and a desire to not tell anybody, somebody who could do something about it, whether it's a mom or a dad. Uh, you know, I'm impressed that you even told your teacher when you were in elementary school about your stepdad, even though you did apparently have support from some other people who were going through the same thing. But still, it is very, very difficult to do that. And the, the main goal 
is just to get through it, get past it, have it go away, and not have to deal with it anymore. Does that sound anything like what you were going through? I think that's something I've gone through my whole life, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you have the meeting with Thomas S. Monson, and now um, I guess he gives you the green light. He gives me the green light. Did he tell mm -hmm. you that at the end of the meeting? I don't remember. Okay. Well, if what... he did, or if I don't remember what he said, whatever he said to me at the end upset me terribly. So even if he had told me about it at the very end, I wouldn't have heard it. Right, and that would have been good news for you, correct? Sure, yeah, that was exactly what I wanted. So, and you do go on your mission, is that a few days after your meeting with Thomas Monson? I'm really not sure time-wise. Okay, but sometime, and I'll just say shortly, I mean within sure. days or weeks? Yes, within days, I think. Okay, you head out to your mission, but you don't go to Columbia, you don't go to Washington, D.C., instead you are sent to where? Wisconsin, Milwaukee Mission. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And at this point in the interview, we're going to end part one of Radio Free Mormon After Dark and the inaugural interview with McKenna Denson. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.